Welcome to Peer Check. I'm your host, Adam Keating, and today we're talking about engineering complexity and cost and how to get that out of your product at scale. I'm joined by global engineering leader, Bob Cilia. Bob has 28 years of experience in leadership roles in engineering, product management, and cost improvements at companies like Stanley Black & Decker. He has led several major change management initiatives, including DTV, DTV and complexity management. Welcome to the podcast, Bob. Thanks, Adam. Happy to be here. So we're going to get into two like pretty heavy topics today, complexity management, cost improvements. Let's start on the complexity side because, you know, thinking back to your Stanley Black and Decker days, massive product portfolio, complexity at scale for that type of product. I'd love to just understand from your perspective, what does complexity even look like and feel like for a company that big with that many products? Like, how do you even manage that? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's something that happens over time, it happens as your product portfolios expand, you know, your markets expand, you expand through acquisitive growth and organic growth. Um, and and in in uh, in Stanley, for example, um, you know there were tens of thousands of SKUs, right? <laughs> um, and and good reasons for that. Um, uh, but it it's it's appropriate to take pause and make sure that you have the right SKUs to serve the markets that you're in um, to remain competitive, but also run efficiently in, you know, in the, in the back of the house, so to speak. I'm curious, like at, you know, 10,000 SKUs, I can't even imagine. I, I've tired enough looking at, you know, a couple of product offerings here at Colab. How do you even look at that? Like, how do you start? How do you segment? Like, give me a little bit of the background of even just the basics. Sure. I mean, that, you know, vastness of complexity. Sure, sure. So um, you really have to start with the end user. You have to start with what the markets, what the users mm -hmm. really need um, mm -hmm. in, in their toolboxes um, and start to uh, look at your product offerings in that way. So uh, like a lot of companies, products are looked in portfolios, families, generations, that sort of thing. Um, and that's how we start to kind of break things down and into manageable bite-sized bite pieces. Um, so starting with um, starting with the market served, starting with um, the brands in your portfolio, um, the good, better, best tiers in in your product offering, um, and start to break these things down into um, into portfolios, and then underneath that into into uh, product families. And then once you start doing that, things become manageable, things become actionable. I'm actually interested. So like your background is engineering and you've done product management as well. And just what you said there about the end user, I assume there's a ton of market research and validation happening alongside of that. When you were in that market in that product management group, what was the split between like engineering and the sort of the like business marketing side that actually drove you know, that product planning, that product strategy, because to get that right, I imagine there's a ton of research. You said like the good, better, best segmentation. I would love to hear like, how does the marketing element and what the market tells you fit into the complexity strategy for your team? Yeah, it, it really tells you what is going to drive users to your products, right? In the end, you want to delight your users mm -hmm. so that the only products they choose are yours. Um, and so understanding truly what they need, what they need, um, is the heart of it all. Um, and, you know, in, in businesses, engineering and product management, uh, typically work hip to hip on these things. Mm -hmm. Um, spending a lot of time over the years, I spent a lot of time talking to end users when I was in engineering and product management, mm -hmm. um, with, uh, you know, with our partner functions. Um, once you start to understand what they need, uh, that becomes the focus. Uh, and then you can start to uncover, well, if, if a user is really interested in, in this thing and they're not in that, well, let's fix that. Right. Was, was there anything you learned over the years that worked really well for getting like the honest, candid user feedback? I mean, you can obviously look at trends and how people buy sorts of stuff like that, but was there any, any qualitative or quantitative measures that really worked well for assessing this? Yeah, uh, certainly a lot of quantitative stuff if you really want to hit a lot of users. Um, uh, but but certain feedback that you're looking for requires face-to-face -face contact. So get out to the point of product use 
um, that is critical. You can you can spend time talking with end users, um, and you can see the products in action and and just observing how mm -hmm. folks are using products is extremely insightful. One interesting thing that just came to my mind is you know you think about Stanley as a, a tool family. Um, obviously, there's commercial and personal uses for a lot of that technology, and the same is true in you know automotive, for example. You'd have people buying an F one fifty. For personal, you also have for commercial very different business lines, albeit the same product. How did you think about like that kind of complexity where it's like potentially the same tool, but it's actually two completely different uses? Like, how does that even factor in? Because I imagine, you know, a hammer in one case might work really well for a personal use. In another case, you're saying, well, that's, you know, not really going to be the thing. How did you think about the two different like segments of end users um, that exist there? Yeah, and like you said, like understand their uses. You know, uh, uh, a, a DIYer like you and me, um, the the frequency of using a hammer is significantly less, right? Um, and and it affects not only the the experience of using the product, but mm -hmm. the lifespan of the product. I mean, pros will go through several of a product type in a year. You and I, you know, will have one for our lifetime, right? <laughs> um, and and so and that starts to set up. Um, a lot of the features and benefits, the specs mm -hmm. of a product mm -hmm. um, to really serve that specific need of a DIYer versus a professional. That's super interesting. And one thing that was interesting that we talked about one time before was like this concept of platforming. You know, you think about a hammer, there's some similarities and pieces that would exist for you, know, you and I, and then obviously there's the commercial application of changes. Talk to me a little bit about platform strategy as a whole, because you know, a 10,000 SKUs, you know, one of the nice things you think about CAD, PLM, all the rest is everything's known as configuration platform approach. How did you guys manage to go from, you know, massive product portfolio to doing something strategic and with a platform approach? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, with a platform approach, um, you know, whether, whether you're, you know, have a clean sheet of, of, of a product offering, or if it's an existing offering, um, you really want to cast a wide net initially. Um, the bookends of the of your platform should be as wide as they possibly can, and then you can tune things up into the, okay, this is the appropriate size of the platform. Um, but you really have to consider things of not just the product, but um, the markets they serve. Um, in a lot of products, there's market differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, there's brand differentiation in companies that have multiple brands in their portfolio. Um, and then there's an understanding of this good, better, best, this DIY versus pro type of, uh, type of approach so that you can start to build your platform and how you need to differentiate in a global market. What, what, when's the right time to even do this, right? Like I think about even us doing software development, there's certain things that are better to just get done. There are certain things to build in a platform approach that we know we can reuse a thousand times. What's the sweet spot? You know, I mean, I imagine if you're a brand new startup and you're building a particular one-off product, maybe you don't want to go that route. But if you know you're going to build 20 more that are very similar, you might want to consider what do you see as like the sweet spot? And I'd love to come back to it after and say, you know, from the big Stanley side, when is it worth making the investment? And then from the startup side, you know, when is it worth it? But in your mind, what's the sweet spot for when platforming is best? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, when to do it, I mean, you know, now, I, I think the the magic is understanding, like you said, is do you have to have st really strict platform strategies for everything? No, you, you know, you got to understand what's going to have the biggest impact mm -hmm. to the business, um, where things are cost challenge, uh, speed to market is, is another big thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, when we look at platform strategies, there's benefits when you start having part reuse, um, there's synergies across designs, across your manufacturing locations, uh, and cost, you know, filters down into that. Um, but there's also benefits in the front end of things. So uh, a lot of companies have very robust new product pipelines and having a strong platform strategy, uh, mm -hmm. it makes that, that roadmap run much, much more efficiently. I mean, if you could, if you can launch families and when you go through, you know, your design exercises, you know, you're designing a platform that has reach across multiple SKUs. Um, same thing when you're going into testing and qualification, 
uh, now you cast a wider umbrella over those activities, over more SKUs. And then when products are in the market and matured and there's cost improvement activities, mm -hmm. now you have a cost improvement activity over a platform as opposed to a SKU. Right. So like you think about it from the big company perspective, let's say you're a big company, big company doesn't have a platform approach in particular, it might even be a whole bunch of acquisitions that have similar products. That's even more complicated, all from different tooling. Where do you start? Like, yeah. where do you start with that? Yeah, you could start simple. Um, you know, in, in, in some of the platform exercises, um, we've done, we, um, you know, we'll, we'll start with product bombs and, um, and you can do a simple differentiation strategy, not just on your product, but on your product bombs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a bomb that has, you know, 12 or, or, you know, or a hundred components, you can link those, those bomb items right back to an end user feature. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that starts to set up, um, the, the differentiation strategy of the products down to the bomb level. So if you have a component and, and you have uh, several different, uh, uh, part numbers for a similar component, you can really boil that down to how is it going to impact the feature of the product on your good, better, best strategy. So we've done it pretty simple like that. You could do a lot of visual things mm -hmm. to point out, Hey, where, you know, where do I have all these unique parts and how do I get to um, a much better ratio of part reuse? Right. And what does that look like in acquisition? Like, let's just say yeah, a Stanley sized company acquires a smaller company they build. You know, a similar hammer, for example, I, I know I've seen it in products I use myself where something gets acquired and you don't know what actually happens to it. They either merge, they say it's separate. It's a weird balance between like, do you keep the original brand that people know and, and are loyal to, or do you merge it together? How do you think about big company strategy on complexity when it comes to like two similar products and brand? Like, how do you manage to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, acquisitions um, with uh, that include a lot of brand equity, right? There's value in those brands. Um, so many times those things continue. Um, but the platform strategy um, is, is one of those things that that certainly should be discussed up front. And it doesn't mean that, okay, we're going to take these new acquired products, we're folding them into our platform, and we're going to invest all this money to make it happen. Um, and, and that's part of the um, of the concerns when you, when you talk internally to the organization of, uh, you know, how do we do this? Um, mm -hmm. and, and what's important is to have those discussions and have those platform plans in place and weave them into your new product development roadmaps. It doesn't have to happen overnight, but if every year you're launching new products, then you're always referring back to that platform strategy. And you're probably slowly turning the wheel to get things back into a, uh, a uniform platform strategy. So it's not such a big investment hit initially. All right. So, I mean, I think in general, like platforming, if you haven't done it from day one, is a bit of a journey, right? Like you're not going to, uh, you're not going to rip up a year and just say, we're going to spend a year platforming. You're going to do it smartly with new product development. You're going to do bite-sized chunks and um, kind of work towards it. And over time, I think you get a bit of a snowball effect. Um, where you get enough critical mass on it, where you do have families at work, new products come through it. Um, I'm curious on the other side of that then. So new company or smaller company, let's say they have a product or two, they're looking then to go into market expansion. Um, and the smartest thing to do is build similar products um, that just serve you know a different segment, different user or good, better, best kind of deal. What's the first steps to take there where they have a little more of a clean slate? Like what's the best investments? Is it getting the features right? Is it, you know, talk to me about what it looks like to do that well when you have a bit of a blank slate. Yeah, certainly a balance between, um, between time invested in platform strategies and, uh, and speed to market, right? Um, and uh, and, and it, it so much depends on, on the product. Um, however, uh, I do think that there's a lot of value in early on um, having uh, having those internal workouts to talk about, hey, what does my technology roadmap look like? What does my product development roadmap look like? And if I'm only going to launch with two products now, but I have vision in the next three years to launch 
10 more mm -hmm. and have those conversations now and try to, to visualize what these things are going to look like. So that, that platform strategy is, um, is not just a one-time thought. It mm -hmm. is part of that development, um, that development roadmap and it can change. Right. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing is that, you know, platform strategies, you know, once you develop one, um, I mean, they're not cast in stone. So many things change, mm -hmm. market conditions change, competitive landscapes change. Right. So, you know, you have to, you have to be willing to, to live by the platform strategy, but also understand that they're going to take left and right turns and, and, and we can adjust. Yeah. And I think my last, my last question to you is more of a internal pitch question because I see it in software development as we're in hardware. Let's say you are that leader in engineering who is pitching the platform strategy. What's your sell to someone internally who doesn't get it? You know, how do, how do you convince people internally? Yeah. It's worth yeah. giving if, if they don't get it, like they don't understand fundamentally the value. What's the yeah. internal pitch? Big challenge. But, you know, organizational change management in this whole thing is, is really, is really the big rock. Um, and, and that, and that in itself is a, is a journey. Um, you know, there's, we talked about you, you know, knowing your end user, um, mm -hmm. internal to the business, know your, your internal end user, mm -hmm. um, and what's, what are the metrics that drive their behavior and aligning these types of initiatives, um, to enable those metrics, you know, speed to market, uh, best in class cost. Um, products with the right features and benefits mm -hmm. to drive user uh, purchase behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting segue because what I was going to say next is like one of the things I see for big companies in particular, besides the speed, is a really good opportunity to standardize not only the complexity of design, which is going to be cost beneficial, but manufacturing as well, right? If you can simplify how many things need to be built, it dramatically reduces the footprint of what actually needs to be produced as well. Um, Let's shift gears a little bit into the cost side of this then. So like you think about this massive portfolio, obviously there's lots of things to think about from a complexity standpoint, but cost is a huge topic today. And there's pressure literally across the industry, every industry to be able to deliver faster products, higher quality and at a lower cost and with better margins and they want everything, right? It's a, it's a tough place to be. And one thing that we talked about before, which I'd be curious just to get like before we dig in your take on, DTV, DTC, and like VAV, what are they? What are the differences? How do you think they show up in a business? And then we'll dig in a little bit from there on strategy. Yeah, so um, a lot of companies are in cost improvement initiatives. Um, and and, um, and in, in my experience with, with DTV, um, to me, DTV isn't just one thing, right? It's a it's a, it's a pull together of a lot of different tools. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it can include elements of, of VAVE, platform planning, SKU management. Um, but to me, that, that value equation, right, yeah. is, you know, that function over cost, like keep that in focus because it doesn't always have to be about, I have to change the denominator. You know, I, I only have to focus on cost. Um, in, in, in many cases, when we, um, when there was design of value initiatives, um, there were opportunities to, uh, to cost optimize. Um, but there were also plenty of opportunities to reinvest part of that back into the product. Um, and uh, in understanding if, if, if there's function or a feature that a user, um, uh, isn't willing to pay for, it's not important to them. So if they're not willing to pay for it. Well, let's reinvest that cost into other parts of the product, um, and and that's where these things really started to to come together. Because now internally, um, the internal sell is, hey, you know, team, this is not just about cost, right? You know, we're going to take some of this cost improvement, we're going to reinvest it back into the product, and now the marketing and the product management teams have something uh, perhaps even new or refreshed um, that that they can go sell into the marketplace. It's interesting because like, I've talked to lots of VAV leaders in particular, and I think, you know, at the surface, value analysis, value engineering, the 
two words in that are value. If you look at what most programs are though, most programs are a cost target to pull cost out of product for the most part. And part of it's because I think value is just like harder to measure. Um, cost is really simple. Like, I mean, yes, there's lots of spreadsheets and there's lots of math to be done, but it's, you know, there's a per unit cost and you can figure out how many units there are and equate that over time. And okay, that's my savings for the year. Value is a little bit more difficult because you've got to go think about and hypothesize what will this be worth? What do you think leaders are missing there? Like the ones who you said kind of get that lens of that equation of function over cost. What do you think they understand or they value that the ones that kind of just focus on the cost side are missing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the, it comes back again to, um, um, getting out and talking to the end user as much as you can, <clears throat> you know, there's, you know, over, over the life cycle of a product. Um, and as it matures and gets approved upon, I think it's easy for engineers to say, Hey, I can do this, you know, bigger, better, faster. Um, and, and you get to a point where you have diminishing returns. Um, and so sometimes there's, um, there's feature enhancement or feature benefit. Mm -hmm. which really isn't driving user benefit anymore. And so now you're pouring cost into, into something that has, you know, diminishing returns. Um, when, when we've challenged ourselves with, you know, do we have the right specs? Um, do we have the right features? Um, and, and not accept, you know, perhaps some of the internal assumptions that may be made. Um, yeah. That's when you can really, uh, make a difference is um, yeah. challenging the status quo, challenging your own decisions for creating specs, and so it creates some delightful debate. Right. Um, but 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 that's why like these VABE or or DTV initiatives um, are are really good when you have a focused organization right. whose responsibility that's for right. It's an independent review of things, um, and you know it can be. Um, there can be a lot of friendly debate, but it's healthy debate at the end. I was just thinking about something when you were speaking there about like the end user. Um, I was thinking of the example you gave about value and like, obviously at the end of the day, the value has to be something the user cares about that they'd be willing to pay for or pick your product over another one. And I think about, you know, things like tools, um, something that as a user, I particularly care about if I'm the segment would be that the battery <laughs> lasts. Like it's something that is as simple as that. Like I think about just vehicles. If there was, you know, Tesla has a couple of vehicles and one has significantly better range at the same price point or roughly the same price point, I'm picking that because to me, range is important. I'd be curious, like across that equation, we talk about the cost part, you can obviously pull parts out because I see lots of companies now getting smarter with, you know, less traditional mechanical add-ons, more interesting electromechanical or software add-ons to add different value. What's been interesting that you've seen? Like what have consumers been interested in from like a, a new value perspective um, that could be things that companies look forward to um, for things like tools, even vehicles. I think mean, Tesla is an interesting example. Now, what have you seen that people are like reinvesting in to create new value? Yeah, sometimes simpler is better, right? Um, uh, you know, some users are, are, uh, are focused in on, hey, I just want something that works. And it's going to last me, you know, a certain time frame, right? And 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 look in 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 disposable type or consumable type of products, there's a, there's an end of life, um, and and products will break. Um, but understanding if something is supposed to last, you know, one month versus six months, you know, where's going to be that point of when something finally fails, the user says. I'm good with this. This lasted as long as I, as I expected it to be. So it's yeah. time to replace. Um, so that comes into the whole durability thing of how things, how things last, mm -hmm. um, you know, simplifying products um, to the point where, you know, there's the um, like the, the functional purpose of a product right. um, versus some of the other bells and whistles. They, you have to know the right balance. I'm curious, like when you go back to doing these events, whether it's a VAV teardown or you're getting the DTV as part of your day to day, what have you seen work? Like, how have you gotten your teams 
engage, energize, like their creative hats on? What's been an effective way that you've seen, you know, that kind of be executed? Yeah. Um, being inclusive, um, you know, in, in, in times where we've gone in and evaluated a product for DTV, it's in someone else's business. Um, and, um, and making the entire organization part of the solution. Once we've identified, Hey, here's the challenge we have in front of us, and this is what we're trying to solve for, mm -hmm. um, uh, making them part of the solution, uh, making it, you know, giving everybody a voice of, Hey, this is what I think it should be. And this is what I think we should do. Um, and you know, it, when those things are successful, what happens is now you're not knocking on someone else's door and say, Hey, I'm here to DTV your product. Um, you have people calling you and say, Hey, I saw what you did over there. Can you help me with this? Yeah. It's, it's an easy one to miss too, right? Because it's complicated in bigger orgs because of number of stakeholders, priorities, like there's a lot of different things to, to kind of manage there. And a question on the backside of that is let's say you do have successful sort of ideation, people are bought in. How do you actually turn that into something real, right? Because you get other initiatives going on, getting back into the design cycle, making changes is not easy. How do you actually drive, how have you seen it done where the urgency is there to get mm -hmm. that change into the next model year? Like, how do you see that working to be effective? Yeah. Um, a couple of things, you know, one is aligning to metrics, right? Um, you know, each business has probably a, a, the two easy ones are our growth and, and profit, right? Um, and aligning all those things and how to help them deliver their, uh, their growth and profit goals is, is one. The second big thing is, is leadership support and sponsorship. That mm -hmm. goes a long, long way um, with these big initiatives. When mm -hmm. there's when there's leadership support, is it buying from the top down? This is not a bottoms up trying to push th something through the organization. So, I think when those things two when those two things come together, mm -hmm. is when you really start to gain momentum on the implementation side of things. Yeah, I think that's beautifully put. Like, I think we've seen a number of programs now. The ones where leaders are a part of it on the ground floor has a dramatically different outcome than the ones where end users are passionate about it but they're fighting an uphill battle or even worse to do the work and then nothing happens with it. That's like the classic, right? You create all these great ideas you do all this great work and then it just sits there. Um, and then people start checking out, right? And then they see, you know, uh, Mr. or Mrs. DTV or VAV coming down the aisle and say, Oh, I'm not dealing with that. I'm too busy. I've seen it now several times, but that's been the pushback that people have been burnt. So I think that's a good lesson that, you know, if you're going to do it, it needs to be aligned top through bottom. Um, and it's like anything, whether you're a massive company or you're a little startup, that focus and alignment is so powerful, but most companies don't do it super well. It's usually a surprise event or something. How do you align people? Like, is it, is it messaging? Is it meetings? Is it documentation? What have you seen from an alignment perspective to get people bought in? Um, let people know the plans. Um, you know, if, if, if. In DTV, you can have a project roadmap too. So, mm -hmm. um, if if you know that you want to target a certain product in uh, in three months down the road, you know, you know, work on that. Show the businesses like, hey, this is my roadmap for for design to value, um, and um, and you can align to their activities to say, all right, well, maybe it doesn't make sense to do this particular project on this particular start date because of resources. Okay, well, let's align on that resource availability um, so that when you do kick things off, you're getting full support from all the functions. Well, we have one, one last loaded question, kind of wrap these two things back together here in complexity and cost, because I think they're so interrelated in many cases. The challenge being that they are so interrelated in many cases, and it can be an overwhelming place to start, especially engineering leadership role, if this is your first time or a new role or new company. How would you suggest somebody manage both at once, complexity and cost? How do you get both of those things to be successful when it's hard enough to do one of them on their own? What's your best advice for managing both? Yeah, I, I, I think when, um, when you're trying to do a lot of these different things um, in one, um, sometimes it's difficult to take an existing product and say, I'm going to do all this, all this stuff at once. Um, in many cases, it might be, Hey, you know, if we talk about 
number of SKUs, or if we talk about a platform plan or these DTV ideas, um, in a lot of cases, it makes sense to take all those insights and findings and roll them into your new product development roadmap. Because that's when things really start to align on the resources. So you're not fighting a cost initiative against a new product launch. I like that because even back to the point we just made a second ago about focus and alignment, people like roadmaps, like as engineers, we like, we like seeing these things. And it's also like providing you have one roadmap per swim lane or whatever it might be. And you're consistent in updating that roadmap that is focusing and it is clear because you're making trade-offs for the team, which is the thing you can ask for. So that's an interesting way to think about that. I don't, from my experience. I don't see that as true in many cases. Most cases, there is like a DTV roadmap over here. There is a product roadmap over here. There is probably 18 other product roadmaps over here. And it's like, you know, someone coming from over here to say, you do your thing over here. And it's always a bit of tension. I don't have the resources. I'm too busy. We have a launch. But when that's ingrained as part of the launch and part of that's going to go back into the plan, I think that is a sweet spot. So that's a, that's a great takeaway. Um, Bob, I wanted to say thank you for joining us today. Um, I think a ton of value and complexity and cost improvement here. Um, and my big takeaway for sure is the sort of the unified roadmap. It's such a simple thing to think about, but such a hard one to actually do properly. And most people won't take that extra step to do it. But I think what you just said is, is the difference. If you do that, the alignment is there, which means two of the other things are just part of what your company is trying to achieve, not you know competing initiatives on big hairy things. So really appreciate your time today.